esteemed guests, both uh, with us in the Nelson Mears Foundation Auditorium of the, of the Chow Chak Wing Museum this evening, all those of us joining us via Zoom. Um, it is my great privilege to welcome you to our National Archaeology Week lecture tonight. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to begin by acknowledging that uh, the Chow Chak Wing Museum and the University of Sydney is built on the grounds of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and that the museum and the university more broadly wishes to acknowledge um, that close connection with land of the traditional owners and we pay our respects to elders of past and present. My name is Dr. Craig Barker. I am the manager of uh, public engagement here at the museum and National Archaeology Week has always been a very special time for us in our old spaces of the Nicholson and Maclay museums. But now that we are in this brand new state-of-the-art facility, this will become one of the marquee uh, activities in our calendar going forward. Of course, National Archaeology Week is an annual celebration of all things achieved in archaeology here in Australia, of both indigenous and uh, historical period, and also acknowledging the work done by Australian archaeologists overseas. And uh, for those of you who would like to know more about Archaeology Week events for this year and more about Archaeology Week in general, the website is archaeologyweek.org. It's even easy enough for me to remember. Um, I will, at the end of tonight's presentation, talk to you about the uh, remaining events that the Chow Chak Wing Museum will be hosting this week. But what I want to do is to get started by introducing our speaker tonight, our lecturer tonight, and we're very, very excited to welcome Professor Keith Dobney. Um, Keith has a PhD from uh, Lancaster, uh, M Science from London, and got his PhD from Bradford. He is an archaeologist, but one who was fascinated by the biology of the past in the intersection and impact of human behavior and cultural development. Keith's main research focus over the past three decades has been on human animal interactions, and he has undertaken major international projects exploring in particular pig and dog domestication, but a whole range of aspects of understanding ancient diets, paleo microbiomes, human spinal health, and even uh, a wartime heritage of the Orkney Islands, which we must get you in to talk about that at some point in time. He's been actively involved in bioarchaeological research in Britain, the Middle East, Central Asia, Central America, Oceania, and Alaska in that time. Um, Keith has had a long and distinguished career at uh, institutions, including uh, Durham, uh, 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 Aberdeen, and more recently uh, at Liverpool. But since February 2020, he has been here at Sydney, um, and of course we've even put on a pandemic to make sure that you stay with us as well. But uh, Keith has taken up <laughs> Keith has taken up the role of uh, of uh, the head of our School of Philosophical and Historical Inquiries and the head of uh, uh, um, the way that the University of Sydney engages with archaeological material, both here and abroad, amongst these many other roles in that capacity. And uh, I, I, I suspect. Um, that we are at the start of a revolution in terms of the way that archaeology is taught, researched and conducted at this university, um, that I know Keith has many ambitions for the future. And I, for one, am very excited to, to see where that journey goes. But for tonight, Keith has decided to title his talk with the rather, rather ambitious title of uh, Can Archaeological Science Save the World? I have no idea whether he's going to answer that question in the affirmative or the negative but I know this is going to be a fascinating journey. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Professor Keith Dobney. Thanks, Thanks, Craig. No pressure or anything. That's good. And when you say 30 years, that starts to worry me a lot. It makes me feel really old. Uh, before I go on, I, as an archaeologist new to this country, I think I'd also like to pay my... Um, great respects to uh, the cultures that have been here for millennia and transformed this place. For me, it's a unique experience. Um, it's changing the way I think about what I do. Um, but I can't claim to be uh, any expert in that field at all. But I will mention a little bit about um, a project here a little bit later in my talk. So tonight, I really wanted to um, 
I'm not going to, you'll be very happy to know I'm not going to talk about pig domestication or dog domestication, much as I love those subjects. I wanted to talk um, about something to scale up the kind of uh, ideas around what we might be able to do with the archaeological record beyond its intrinsic interest to, uh, of studying the past and, and being able to reveal the past, which is why we do it. And I'm following on from my, uh, my, my esteemed and fantastic colleagues who've been giving talks, which I've been coming to when I can this week, um, on all kinds of interesting and diverse subjects. Um, and I hope I live up to their, uh, their, their uh, professionalism. But I want to look and take us out of traditional archaeology, although I'm going to talk about it quite a bit, and actually uh, think hard about something I've really become interested in, having worked on diverse projects. It's really about why, we st why archaeology might be relevant beyond studying the past. Okay, let's turn this on. Let's do that. All stuck. So there's a, there's a debate and still going on and, and, and since I've been in the field um, around whether archaeological science really even exists, whether we should call it archaeological science, because why isn't collecting data and interpreting it science? And we do that across all of archaeology. It's been traditionally thought of as, as you know, machines that go bing or you know, something that we study separately to the real archaeology, which is digging holes in the ground. And this debate, um, an argument still goes on and you know, some of my colleagues back in the UK um, used to think that what we were doing wasn't proper archaeology. We, you know, we were servicing the real archaeologists with information that they needed that they could then synthesize. That's changed a lot and I think with new really advanced techniques and approaches that keep developing all the time, uh, the, the, the transformation that that has had in the field really uh, doesn't make it a sideline anymore or, or viewed as a sideline. I never thought it was and lots of other people didn't, but actually is one of the things that's driving a completely new way of thinking and doing archaeology. So it is, I think it's archaeology. I, I don't like the term archaeological science and many people don't, but it is a fascinating and the reason I love it so much and many people do interdisciplinary space, which doesn't really exist in lots of other subjects. And so we can actually explore things in many different ways. And I'm going to really focus on the stuff that I'm interested in and I've been working on for a long, long time. And that's the biological remains in the past. I'm not going to try and cover every single aspect of um, science applications in archaeology, and of which there are many. And I will really be just um, talking about the tip of the iceberg tonight. I'm going to really focus on some of the biological remains, primarily um, the vertebrate remains eye bones and animals and some of the things we can do with them and that includes humans and I should have warned people in advance that there are some not too many but some slides of human remains so um, I apologize for not doing that in advance so there's all these amazing things that we can do with sediments and remains and bones that are excavated directly with proper archaeology from archaeological sites but why is it relevant beyond interpreting the past uh, and to be honest, I never really thought about it. I just thought it was interesting and fascinating. And I was lucky enough to be A, studying it, and then B, getting a job in it early on. And I um, really was thinking hard about how we understood the questions about the past and what people were doing in the past and how the environment looked in the past. And I wasn't thinking about the relevance until, and the only time I ever did that was, uh, and this is my only anecdotal story, so I promise I won't tell too many jokes. This isn't a joke, this is actually real and true, is, um, just at the end of, uh, or the beginning of 2000, I think, uh, a story appeared in the newspaper that a skull had been found in Ireland in a plastic bag in rural Ireland by um, a local farmer, and it had a bullet hole in its head. And this was thought to be the most famous racehorse ever that ever lived, Shirgar, who had been kidnapped by the IRA and then disappeared. And everybody thought that, this, that he'd, uh, he'd been um, disposed of, uh, too hot to handle, basically. And there's a, a book and a film made about it. And this, was, this made the headlines for a few days. 
And this was it's the only photograph I could ever find on the web. So I apologize about how bad it is. It's pixelated to help. But here you can see a skull of something that looks like a domestic animal, big one with two bullet holes, clearly bullet holes in the skull. And um, this skull was then uh, taken to the police. The police then took it to the place that did all kinds of amazing scientific research um, on the genetics uh, and uh, morphology and everything of, of, uh, of, uh, of horse racing. And this was the Irish Equine Center in County Kildare. And they decided it couldn't be Sheargar because it was uh, a skull of a much younger horse than the racing legend, right? So there's Leiden, who I tried to ring up on numerous occasions, but he was not taking my calls stated that um, this was a horse of at least five years of age and it couldn't possibly be uh, Shiga. Uh, sorry, Shiga was five years of age, but this was a two-year-old horse. And um, everybody was disappointed because they thought they found the most famous, and they thought they'd understood what Shiga, um or what had happened to Shiga. whoops. And the only problem with that was that the reason that I thought I've got some relevance here is because it was pretty clear that that was a skull from the photograph, even the bad photograph, of a cow. And so it was amazing to me there were people pronouncing uh, all kinds of things that were supposed to be experts and couldn't actually do the basic identification. And I'm not joking, they are pretty different, uh, even if you don't know much about um, uh, the morphology of vertebrates. But um, I thought, wow, we can say something about you know, a, a topical issue in the newspaper that you know, we have some relevance here. A tiny bit, obviously, but nobody bothered to listen to us. And there was a little tiny uh, piece published in the paper. A colleague of mine had uh, made a comment, another zoo archaeologist saying, and it, nobody really bothered and thought that we'll just shuffle that. And the guy at the Irish Equine Centre obviously never took our calls. So I think he was too embarrassed, obviously. But anyway, that was the relevance. Um, the, but then to go from that to thinking about um, issues around uh, you know, current big, massive issues of today that we're familiar with, we all have our opinions on, we all worry about. Um, all of these are things that are happening now, but it's pretty clear that all these things are not just things of, uh, that are, have come from a vacuum and are only about the last five, 10, 100, 200 years. They're things that we can um, use our data from the past to maybe explore and inform. And why wouldn't we do that um, when it exists? That's an interesting question because many people working in all these fields, particularly in climate change, um, a big proportion of those are really only interested in the last 50 to 100 years worth of meteorological data and not about the bigger scale, temporal scale, as well as the geographic scale, which is kind of um, a bit sad. And that, that surprised me, um, having been involved in some of those debates very early on. So it began to not just interest me, but interest many other people that we were collecting all this incredibly interesting biological information, which potentially had some relevance way beyond the archaeological record. And as I said, there were plenty of people thinking about this. And in terms of conservation, and one of the, uh, my colleagues is a zoo archaeologist, much better known than I am in the States, published um, a, a pretty important paper just saying, look, you know, we can actually use this. There are experiments that have been run naturally in the past, and we have the data for those experiments. So why wouldn't we use that to explore uh, questions around modern day conservation issues, for example, to, to, to start thinking about whether species are invasive or pest species? Where were they in the past? Are we making the right decisions about where we put what kinds of environments we're putting them back into? Should we do that? What was it like before? Nobody was asking those questions and we began to get interested in doing that. And there are plenty of other people writing uh, excellent articles and books and, and conference monographs over the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, essentially thinking much, much bigger, which is really interesting. And some of those debates are actually huge and controversial and involve uh, archeology span smack bang in the center of that. And I've, I've included this because this is something that in, has intrigued me, uh, nothing, I, I had nothing to do with this, and it's using similar technology to um, that, um, if any of you went to the Angkor, uh, taught by Roland Fletcher, looking at LIDAR surveys of the Amazon jungle and, and, and finding, scarily, lots of archaeology under what is supposed to be uh, described by um, conservationists uh, and ecologists as pristine Amazonian jungle. And loggers have been obviously 
decimating these areas and also finding uh, archaeology. And the story about whether they're pristine or not um, is now being taken up by the logging um, uh, folk and the, 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 the huge industry that that is to actually justify the fact, well, you know, Amazon rainforests grow back pretty quick, right? Because clearly they've been cleared once and we can do it again. But the scale is much different. So the, the debate around archaeology, there are sadly um, conservationists trying to or try not to believe the archaeological record and the archaeological evidence. Fascinating, but um, we'll move on from that. So climate, you know, there's something quite important about studying climate in a temporal context. And we know that from not just the archaeological record, but from much deeper paleoecological studies that uh, other groups and other people have done. But for us, sorry, I'm always doing the same as everybody else. The really interesting thing is the last 10,000 years has been probably the most stable climatic uh, conditions that we've ever had, particularly temperature wise, until now when it's going in a very different direction. But before that, we've got records going back millions of years. This is unique. And what's happened in this period is a bunch of very important things that have incredibly serious, significant consequences for our world today and how we understand it. And also in terms of our, our health, our diet, our evolutionary history, there's a whole bunch of things that actually are wrapped up in the archaeological record, which we can use to actually deploy um, in a much, much bigger context and, and to actually help support um, a much bigger set of questions. And there's this whole idea, I'm sure some of you have heard of the new human epoch called the Anthropocene, this period of time where humans have had a massive, significant, um, detrimental impact on the planet. And there's a big argument about when this actually, when this epoch begins. Uh, most of the, of the people working in uh, the, the, the field and publishing the journal are talking about the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, clearly huge impacts, but a lot of us are thinking, actually, humans have been having massive impacts on the planet for much longer than that. And the Anthropocene is probably more like the Holocene, the last 10,000 years. Farming is one of the big um, drivers in that debate. And you can look at, you know, when we talk about modern conservation, this is my house back in, up in the Orkney Islands. Sorry, that's a shed. That's my house. Back in, well, I could live in that. It's not too bad. Um, this is a completely man-made landscape but it's a nature reserve it's got um very rare plants it's got a whole bunch of things but it, it only exists because of um people farming from prehistory same here up in narrabri uh, this project which um i'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute this is um you know a completely transformed landscape both by um more recent uh, settlers but for a long period of time managed and um transformed and utilized by um, indigenous peoples and this wouldn't look like that because uh, it, this is about human impact so when I listen and, and archaeo other environmental archaeologists listen to conservationists talking about we need to keep things exactly as they are in the pristine environment as they always you know, were this is a fallacy uh, we know that from the archaeological record it doesn't mean to say we should disagree with conservation efforts but we have to frame it in a way that actually makes sense and also frame it in a way that doesn't turn the entire planet into a museum. So as I said, lots of people have been thinking about this uh, question and there are a bit, there's a really, really good, interesting recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, really looking at the kind of bioarchaeological record. And when I say bioarchaeology, some people take that to mean the study of human remains. That's really a, a term that comes from the States. But in Europe and the UK, we primarily mean the biology of the past particularly the, the, the bioarchaeological record. And there are a whole bunch of case studies, and there are many more than this, that are looking at these bigger issues around global colonization, the spread of peoples around the planet, which is still happening at a pace. Uh, with that, the spread of organisms, including farming, which has had, you know, transforms landscapes, sometimes for the, for the better, but mostly for, for the worst. We have these uh, colonization of small, unique, pristine environments all of a sudden people and, and uh, domestic animals and pests turn up and we have complete transformations and change there. And that's still happening. And we have 
the rise and the development of big urban centers, which we are really thinking about um, how we make them greener, how they're more sustainable, but organisms are also changing to adapt to the new environments of creating. So there's a huge space in here for the, the archaeological record, particularly for the bioarchaeological record for, to inform. And it's not just about the last 10,000 years uh, from farming, it's not just about other organisms. We are directly transformed through our evolutionary history. And, and can we look at that and explore that in a way that makes, um, ask bigger questions than, well, there's a pretty big question that who, where, who we are and where we came from. I guess that's a huge question. But other questions of, you know, how has our evolutionary history shaped who we are today, shaped our health, impacted our health, uh, changed how we behave and changed um, our genetics. And I only put this, uh, this slide up really because um, I want to talk about um, much deeper time a little bit later. But there's some fantastic you know, new discoveries, as you know, all the time in archaeology, which transform completely the way we think. And some of these new techniques then start transforming what we can understand about those new, uh, new data sets. And those were the, these uh, miniature or dwarf hominids found uh, on the, in island Southeast Asia on uh, Flores in the Philippines. So the environment, what we eat, where we live, what we do culturally, et cetera, impacts our health. So disease and health is something we can directly address, not just exploring in the past, but we can actually, you know, we need to understand our current health situation. So what better way to do that, not just to do uh, modern recent studies on living people right now. We need an evolutionary perspective. We need a temporal perspective on that to look at, for example, evolution of pathogens. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and I'm trapped in Australia for the last 15 months and I've been reading lots about it, but there's a, a, a lot of information that we can glean from the same kinds of things that have absolutely inevitably happened in the past. And those experiments that have already been run that we couldn't possibly do now ethically, kill lots of people with, uh, with Yersinia pestis, for example, we can still recover that data and with new techniques like ancient DNA, particularly begin to explore uh, things beyond the, the past and, and actually make them relevant to modern clinicians, for example. A um, bit difficult, uh, difficult to argue at the moment, but the techniques are, uh, and the way we do stuff is changing radically. So that's the kind of broad, framework I wanted to give you to set a few projects, that, uh, I, various little projects that I've been lucky enough to be involved with and just go through uh, some of those things and show you a little bit more detail, not too much science, I promise, um, and not too many graphs, in fact, almost none, so that's good. Uh, just really to illustrate some of the points about sustainability, about health, about diet, about environment, and about how we can use our archaeological data, our bioarchaeological data beyond uh, sometimes way beyond uh, under, just simply understanding the past because we're interested in it. So I've been involved, um, as Craig kindly said, when I was at the University of Aberdeen, a new archaeology department we set up there, focused on the north. We were very lucky to be invited uh, through one of my colleagues who was uh, uh, an American who worked in this part of the world before he came to Aberdeen to a project in, on the Bering Sea um, in Western Alaska right here in Yupik territory. These are Yupik Eskimos, not Inuit. They identify as Eskimos. Indigenous people that do not farm. You can't farm really in this part of the world very well. Uh, they are still essentially exploiting wild resources uh, and um, eating a very um, carbohydrate-rich, sugar-rich, fat-rich Western American diet. So there's an interesting contrast there, but the archaeology is amazing. In permafrost in uh, subarctic conditions, uh, the preservation of the biology, so the things that would normally disappear on most archaeological sites, things that aren't hard like stone, the things that aren't calcified like teeth and bones, wood, insects, pollen, uh, grass, wooden masks. Look at this. this is, these are museum, hundreds of museum quality objects coming out of this um, it's difficult to dig. It's digging wet peat, basically, with um, ice underneath. So you can only dig at certain times of the year. But they're an amazing uh, set of archaeological data. But in amongst that archaeological data, in amongst all this sediment, is all this amazing biology, including human feces, human hair, um, all kinds of 
dog feces, uh, the skins of seals, the skins and guts, so all, all the butchery waste that hasn't decomposed. Must have been a great place to live uh, with sod houses, um, tons, you know, all the archaeological material, 90% of what you find, we found on this site you'd never find would never be preserved. So we a fantastic snapshot of a period in time which is incredibly important. Uh, quite late, still prehistoric, just about pre-contact, um, but around the site, the occupation of the site straddles this period of the Little Ice Age, in the medieval period, 1500 um, AD to about 1600 AD, there was a cold snap which in Europe um, essentially made all the rivers freeze over. It was seriously cold for a while. Uh, on the other side of the planet, exactly the same was happening. And what was interesting for us, not beyond the archaeology and beyond um, the, the wish for the local community to re-engage with their heritage, which they were concerned they were losing and their children were, were, were losing their oral, oral his, history traditions, losing their uh, connection to country, losing their connection to their, um, their rich heritage. There was a, a fantastic record here of uh, a, a, an adaptation to a very different environment, a rapid climate change. Okay, it's getting, it was getting colder then and then warmed up again, but now, right now it's getting warmer and the reason this uh, rapidly getting warmer and the reason this is, uh, site was being excavated because right over there is the Bering Sea every time there was a storm most of this got washed away the permafrost is melting the reason they wanted to do archaeology and they weren't really happy with archaeologists for the decades before that was because they were losing all these um, they were finding all these things on the beach every storm and they wanted to actually find a way to actually re-engage with it and for us, it was not only about working with the local community, it was also about um, looking at this amazing uh, paleoecological record as well as the archaeological record. So it was a partnership. Uh, we were looking, doing all kinds of outreach and engagement. It was, you know, it was very much like uh, what Annie uh, Clark, my colleague, was describing. Uh, I work on Groot Island, very much in the same vein, co-creation. And what was fantastic from, from my perspective was looking at the zoo archaeological, the, 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 the remains of the animals, the really important salmon run the fish bones that are on the site you know these they're, they're really they're still today hugely economically important to to, to the canadian pacific um the remains of caribou the remains of seals the remains of domestic animals um, we were able to think about this and ask some of these very um interested and, and re-engaged older hunters about what our data meant because there were some very odd things we found you know that that weren't um we we weren't expecting on the basis of the uh, what we know about the ethnography and about the uh, uh, the uh, the hunting today so the frequency of fish different kinds of uh, salmon chains so we were looks like there were impacts on the salmon runs through this period uh, Caribou today, um, uh, uh, they're e even in the last two generations, they're noticing that they're not coming anywhere near the, anywhere near the site anymore. They're a lot, they have to go much further to get them. Different kinds of, we were finding different kinds of seals, which were much preferring uh, much colder climates or much colder e uh, ecosystems. So what was happening 400 years ago is not exactly the same now, but we can begin, they were really interested in this data and they're helping us interpret it. And they were fascinated by the fact that that had happened and we could document those changes because that could give a predict, make, provide a predictive tool to understand what might happen when temperatures change, which they are doing right now, rapidly. So I mentioned the, uh, the Narrabri project, so the, the, the Australian project that, I, that I'm very excited about. And this is, again, you know, a, a, a community uh, project which is essentially um, driven by the community uh, and based uh, at the campus, Sydney campus of Narrabri, Institute of Agriculture, Plant Breeding Centre. And one of the people that works there, uh, Angela Patterson, a postdoc, here she is with my colleague Tim Denham, who is uh, hopefully getting involved with this with the project, looking at these um, native grasses. And she has instigated and, and built up a, a, a very deep relationship with uh, the local communities because they're very interested in, in, in re-engaging with how to process and how to economically, um, uh, to, to, to get uh, an economic gain from 
potentially the health food industry around native grasses. And obviously, there have been a long, long tradition of the exploitation of these uh, native grasses, kangaroo grass, for example. And here we have some, I've uh, tasted some of these, they're delicious, uh, experiments with kind of hybrid baking with using some of these. Um, but I got a phone call completely out of the blue from Angela saying that they were really wanting to do this in the present, but they realized um, with discussions with the community that they were not, they'd forgotten the, 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 the oral history and they'd forgotten the pre most of the, uh, the processing techniques and what was used and how much and how good they were to thresh. And so we, it really suddenly lit a light bulb in my head that we could join those dots from the past to the present because um, to explore that kind of paleoecological and archaeological record, both in the present, because there are distributions of plants now that obviously reflect how people have lived on that country for um, a very long time. Um, there's an interest from uh, the local community, but there's also a fantastic opportunity to, for archaeologists to explore, uh, do some experimental work with um, cropping and threshing and looking at changes in genetics and phenotypes to not just address the archaeological um, uh, questions that we're interested in, but also to help uh, develop the economic uh, and the plant um, adaptation and plant exploitation side of things by understanding the past better and using that as a model maybe to actually frame the present and the future going forward. And that beautifully sits into this context uh, and I'm guessing you might have all heard of um, Bruce Pascoe and his, uh, his controversial book called Dark Emu. Whether you believe it or not, he set up a fantastic hypothesis to test which this project at Narrabri fits beautifully right in the center of as almost um, a test case. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's our duty to try and then explore that in a way that is actually not um, exploitative, but actually directly collaborative. And whatever we think about um, Bruce's ideas, it's clear that um, serious engagement with the land was going on and serious um, modification of organisms, mostly plants, and the, and the landscape was happening. But we don't know too much about it. And the archaeological record is just wait, the, the culture of the archaeological record is just waiting there to be joined up a bit more, a bit more um, systematically. Another community project, but a very different community. This is a community of, of academics and NGOs uh, I was very lucky to work on is um, one based in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we were lucky enough through the Global Challenge Research Fund, which was the UK's uh, recent uh, funding call to put big interdisciplinary teams together from the humanities and the sciences to uh, address big global questions. Perfect. Uh, most of those aren't going to be involved in archaeology, most of us thought. Um, but it was clear that, they, uh, that you had to put projects in which involve both the humanities and the sciences. And this one was really driven by vets and uh, policymakers and people interested in zoonotic diseases and the, the, the production, livestock production in the Horn of Africa, where pe most people rely on huge numbers of um, both locally, huge numbers of livestock, but also for export to places like uh, the Arabian Peninsula. But these areas are riven with all kinds of uh, diseases for zoonotic diseases which impact people and animals but they're also um, uh, a place where there are many different local indigenous and imported breeds of cattle sheep and uh, goats particularly the mainstay uh, uh, livestock species there which are impacted in different ways and have adapted in different ways some not at all because they've been introduced recently you know, to produce more milk but others very well adapted over millennia to tsetse fly, to drought, to a whole bunch of things. So the archaeology bit of this, which was another call out of the blue from um, somebody who was on my interview panel. In fact, the guy that ran this project was actually on my interview panel for my job at Liverpool and remembered that I worked on animal bones and thought, actually, that might be interesting. And so um, we got this fantastic project, which makes me think very differently about um, my subject again, which is essentially putting the temporal context on the questions that these modern vets 
and um, people are interested in zoonotic diseases are interested in because through these new techniques of ancient DNA, for example, amazing science, and you, you could say it was archaeological science because it uses mostly archaeological material, we can actually explore um, the, the diverse range of um, livestock today. Some of them are indigenous breeds, some of them are really well adapted to um, uh, drought and to various dis uh, diseases, endemic diseases, but they are being replaced and disappearing pretty quickly in uh, uh, replaced by modern uh, European livestock. And so through ancient DNA, we can start to say, okay, what was there in the past? Where was it? When was it there? We can then start to look at um, things that we know that modern geneticists have found, disease resistance genes, uh, product, milk production genes, looking at the animal bones, sampling um, these for ancient DNA. What's really fascinating as well is a whole, a whole um, archive of amazing rock art which can tell us about the different varieties of cattle as well as the ancient DNA. So we can, we can take traditional archaeology and add that into the picture on some of these amazing sites. And completely out of the blue and accidentally we realize that Ethiopia, like, uh, in, like parts of medieval uh, Europe, for example, have a massive archive of manuscripts that go back at least 500, maybe to 1,000 years uh, in various places. And the National Archive has got huge numbers of these. And lots of them have got little bits falling off. And they're all made of sheep and, and sheep and goats and cattle and other things we found. And so we're doing a, a project on the ancient DNA of these. So we can get whole um, flock information from uh, the pages of manuscripts. And these have got diseases. These have got pathogens, actually, which we've sequenced in these skins, even though they've been prepared. So this is a unique mine of new information which can tell us about what was going on in the past, but also can look at the evolution of these pathogens, where they were, uh, what species of, uh, of, uh, of livestock they were in. We're right at the beginning of this. This is a real proof of concept, but this is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. We're not just thinking about when the zebus turn up, which is also quite important. Okay, from cows and diseases to other health, but of humans, I mentioned back pain in my, uh, I thought I'd better talk about it in my abstract, obviously. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in vertebrates and humans are another, another species of vertebrate. Uh, I don't consider them to be special, so that's why I don't just study human bones. Um, I like the comparative stuff, but I got interested, well, I started off working on the remains of humans um, at the University of Bradford and be up before that with uh, a, a person called Don Brothwell, who was uh, a pretty um, inspirational person in, uh, himself. But the back pain uh, thing came completely out of the blue. Um, why would we want to study back pain? How can we do that in the archaeological record? And, and, and who cares? Well, apart from osteologists who are interested in seeing whether you can see changes to the spine, it's a huge problem today. Um, and there are lots and lots of people here. There's a specialist unit, which I'm talking to, and they're very excited about the project, uh, working specifically and only on the causes of back pain. And nobody really knows why. Uh, it affects enormous numbers of humans. It affects almost no other primates. Certainly the pathology of the spine, we don't see that in other primates. It costs the economy, huge amounts of money in the US and the UK and other parts, I'm sure in Australia too, with people off work. Um, so it's a big issue. Uh, and it also makes people uh, feel bad and have uh, um, their well being impacted significantly. But we don't really know much about it. And there's been lots of suggestions that because we, have, we are very unique in terms of our locomotion, that maybe it has something to do with that. That is about our very deep evolutionary history. So we thought it'd be really interesting to do something quite simple and explore that to see whether A, that was true, the archaeological question, and B, whether that we could use that to actually explore or at least frame the bigger issue of, uh, of back pain in modern, modern people today, and maybe even have something which we might be able to use to, to predict it. So all we did was to do something uh, pretty simple, was uh, to do some fancy statistics on shape analysis. This is geometric morphometrics, just essentially capturing, not just measuring linear things, just capturing the shape in 2D and in 3D. And we looked at uh, some archaeological medieval specimens and we compared them to um, our nearest modern examples of our closest primate relatives, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and um, 
uh, orangutans, none of which are bipedal like us. They do walk sometimes on two legs, but they are morphologically incapable of doing it like we do. So that's good. Um, and we also then said, okay, well, what do they look like in terms of shape? For healthy people, so ones that don't have, this is in the archaeological remains here, you can see we can identify pathological conditions. This is something called a Schmalls node, which is a, a kind of compression fracture or a herniation between the discs. And you can see this in um, archaeological remains. There's another one which is essentially a spondylolis, spondyl, I always get this wrong, spondylolysis. And this is uh, where you have a fracture of a slight curvature of the bottom of the spine and a fracture of the transverse process here. So two different things. Uh, what would the shape of this compared to a normal one look like? And what would the shape of this compared to a normal one look like compared to our nearest non-bipedal relatives? And what this slide, I didn't want to show you all the, uh, all the statistics and the numbers because that's all we can see really. But uh, what's fascinating and, and, and absolutely amazing, uh, I never thought it was going to be this straightforward, was that if we took um, the distribution of shape, so this is where the distribution of the shape of the variation, the shape of, um, I think this is a lower vertebrae and a thoracic vertebrae of a chimpanzee and a modern human, modern homo sapiens, they overlap a little tiny bit, but they're quite different. Um, if we look then at um, the ones with the non-healthy ones, so these are the healthy ones. If we look at the non-healthy ones, these are the ones with the Schmalls nodes. They all cluster right at the, this end, the derived end of this distribution, whereas the one I can't pronounce goes here, right at the other end, the extreme end of the variation. And what's really clear from this is that we have um, in our, in modern humans today, we need to look at a lot more of us, particularly uh, people, you and I walking around, and that's the next, the next uh, wonderful part of the project. We've got an ancestral shape in some, in some of us, which predisposes us directly to back problems. We have an exaggerated, one at the other end of the spectrum, an exaggerated um, adaptation for bipedalism. So people at this end of the spectrum will get the condition I can't pronounce. So we have an ancestral shape and, a, and, a, and an exaggerated um, shape, all associated with our upright stance. And that's absolutely fantastic in terms of asking the question, well, what about the early hominids, what do they look like? Well, what's really interesting, they should be somewhere on the way, but closer to the ancestral shape. And of course they are, which is really fantastic. But the great thing beyond the archeological relevance of this is that we can then say, actually, we can now predict who will have likely to have back problems. And maybe because of the amount of time that, um, or the amount of money and the amount of um, the, the, how big a problem it is, we could use this in a much more uh, extended way beyond archaeology. And, and clinicians might be, and there are people that we are talking to at the moment, they're really fascinated by this. Uh, there are surgeons who are saying, well, actually, our surgery is quite, you know, it's not fantastically detailed or targeted. We might be able to utilize the detail if we can get CT scans and, and then start to look at those shapes and start predicting where we actually um, intervene in terms of some aspects of surgery. That's probably a long way off, but the prediction tool I think is really fascinating. Um, anyway, and I go from hominids back pain to really the thing I've been most interested in for a long time, and that is uh, a diet and what that does to us, what's that done to us in our evolutionary trajectory. And you know, we, we've all heard of this phrase, we are what we eat, and most of us are, that's for sure, uh, both biologically uh, and chemically. And we've gone from um, essentially primate, mostly fruit eaters, to um, early exploitation of, uh, very early exploitation, whether it's hunted or scavenged, of protein, mostly meat, to today, which is uh, associated, and this isn't, this, is, this shouldn't be funny, this is a serious, serious world issue. Everybody knows about this. Everybody knows about the diabetes revolution. That's got to do with the last 10,000 years of that fuse that was lit with the origins of agriculture and our, our reliance on a very limited number of species and our reliance on um, plants 
and tons of carbohydrates and a lot of sugar. And these recent health trends are, in, uh, are directly linked to the diet. And there's been a lot of discussion, as you probably know, around is there a mismatch between our evolutionary history, you know, how we've, what we used to eat and how healthy we were then and, what we, and our activity levels to um, the diets that we have now. And the big uh, thing in the big question mark in that, well, not question mark, the big hand grenade in that is the origins uh, of farming and the, and the development of um, more and more reliance on limited resources that are mostly high in carbohydrates. So a massive change in our diet. And has our evolution kept up with that, essentially? And is, 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 the, is the current um, epidemic of diabetes, for example, and heart disease linked not just to our recent lifestyle, but much, much more to our evolutionary history? So there are people who still think we might be, you know, are we still paleolithic hunter-gatherers evolutionarily uh, in a modern industrialized world, which is now impacting us significantly? And we can see this through, you know, archaeological science. Again, lots of people have been exploring Neanderthals and, and, and uh, the transition periods between agriculture and, and hunting and gathering and finding some really fascinating things. Uh, Neanderthals, in terms of their isotope, the, the, the delta N15, nitrogen 15 values are higher than the top carnivores. So they are eating tons and tons of meat and protein. There's a lot of debate about whether what else they're eating and whether this is a real fair um, um, representation, but they are seriously extreme uh, in any way you look at them. And they are right up here above top level carnivores. But the isotopic signals, signals can also tell us about other things. They, can, they have a very clear, where people have been eating a lot of fish and shellfish, whether it's marine or, or riverine, we can tell that very clearly from the, uh, from the isotopic record. And in the later Paleolithic and uh, Mesolithic, we have a very strong signature that shifts into fish and shellfish, which is really interesting. And here you see um, one example from um, the UK, paper published in 2003. You can see it's a complete shift from this high uh, marine valley. Think of where the Neanderthals were over here. Um, this, is, this is now uh, carbon. Uh, isotopes but this little cluster down here look at the dates this is, goes from uh, this goes through the Holocene around about 5,000 years ago just a bit later when agriculture arrives quite late in the UK everybody suddenly has a completely different uh, very limited and very clustered uh, totally different signature they're not eating any of any of uh, they're eating livestock and, and lots of imported and grown cereals so there's this farming is this massive um, explosion and change, um, whether you think it's for the better or for the worse, most of us now think it's probably for the worse in terms of our health, uh, in terms of our reliance, but we, we have lit a fuse and we can't go back. And it happens at different times all over the world. It starts in the Middle East, probably in the Holocene, it's in, the, in New Guinea with different species pretty early. There's Bruce Pascoe's idea that whether you call it agriculture or not, there's something going on in Australia. Not 100% convinced about that, but depends how you define it. But there's an, a massive change across the planet. There's a reduction in the dietary breadth of what people are eating, and it impacts our evolutionary history and our health. There's no doubt about that. And we'll explore that a little bit in, uh, in, in a very fancy way in a minute. So here's what we think we know about um, just a general synopsis of the changes through, you know, big changes in, our, in what we eat and therefore what might impact on our health through time, this is very general, different across the planet, but we have this period here where all of a sudden everything changes. And for that reason, today, uh, if we look at differences between um, uh, the total energy that we have calculated likely and what we know from modern current US diet, there are some areas which are hugely different. I mean, hugely different. So start getting worried when you go to the supermarket. And this has kind of uh, had a, a, there's a debate around what, um, why this might impact um, both us, but also um, indigenous people around the world. Uh, the thrifty gene hypothesis is really about um, our adaptability to, um, to potential um, times of lean times where there are food shortages uh, and the selection that's gone on in that space, once you then release all that and uh, feed people a modern Western US diet, all of a sudden that catastrophic change um, 
is, is a real mismatch. So this thrifty gene hypothesis has been used to explain high rates of, uh, of obesity and diabetes. You find across indigenous groups uh, that, have, that have really, like in Alaska, like here, uh, and like in many other places, where uh, a westernized US style diet is really something which um, is um, mostly what people are eating. And it's a successful ad adaptation gone wrong. And there's, then that's, from that has spun off, uh, I'm, hope you, I'm sure you know, all these ideas about the paleo diet, well, we must be, we should go back to eating only mammoths again, or, uh, or large elephants or cave bears or whatever. And you must eat like a caveman. I love these titles. This is my favorite one. I have to say, I have no idea what Jesus would eat, but I think there's a book that says at least it's a bit of bread and fish and whatever else in there. But anyway, so here's the cool science. This is the cool bit now, right? So um, beyond the isotopes and doing sampling, there are, um, a long time ago, there were a, a few of us um, and I can claim that I was one of the first people to think, to think about this with this inspirational mentor of mine, a guy called Don Brothwell, who had the idea when I was very young. Well, this is about diet, surely. You know, this stuff that's stuck on the teeth of, uh, of animals and, and humans that we, that we excavate and have in our collections, that must be about diet. Lots of dentists were obviously exploring, you know, what, what would be good toothpaste to use, what would be, you know, what, what kills this, what, would our mo what does our modern... Um, oral health look like, I and mean, there's a lot of lot of stuff published, but nobody had ever looked at this just by uh, simply by just recording that there was a lot of it or not so much. And there was a lot of it, and it turns up much more commonly, it, it seems, around the time of agriculture and past past the origins of agriculture. So changes in that diet, which we can ref can see in other things, seems to impact how much dental plaque and then calculus. And if we don't have toothbrushes and we're not, you know. Uh, flossing our teeth on a regular basis this is what happens right so in this calcified matrix solid hard preserves really well um what can we do with it and you know who the hell cares except dentists well archaeologists do and i love this slide because i found this and this is supposed to be um sarcastic right i think this is brilliant because it's exactly what we're doing now and i can tell you why we're doing it in the mouth is uh, all these amazing, you know, you've got an, a, a, an ecosystem, just like you've got in your gut and on your skin, everywhere. You've got this microbiome, and this is what it looks like, stained, uh, it's not very nice. It's got food debris in there, so there's pollen, there's bits of meat, there's stuff that you floss off, and it starts soft, and for reasons that we still don't really understand, it calcifies and turns hard, and then your dentist, most of you have been like me to the dentist and had it, scraped off or been told off by the dentist for not doing it properly and there it is in all its glory 30 years ago when we put some of this stuff under a microscope that's what we were seeing and we were thinking blimey that's really interesting plus we found lots and lots of pollen grains and bits of hair we couldn't identify you know tons of fantastically well preserved tons and tons of biological remains trapped in this tiny little thing on on the teeth of of uh, of, of humans and animals in archaeological sites across the planet. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could identify this stuff one day? Because it would, wouldn't it tell us a lot, not just about diet, but it would tell us about um, the oral, oral health and the oral microbiome. But nobody really was looking at too much then. And the microbiome studies now and microbes uh, uh, are you know, probably the most important and influential thing that a lot of modern uh, medics are, are studying. Lots of people interested in diet. Um, there's the microbiome of your gut um, and, and your skin and various other, of, of, uh, other parts of your body. You're just one living mass of you know, amazing ecosystems um, are probably responsible for a whole range of things, including depression and you, know, you name it, the microbiome has been linked to it. So an enormous amount of money and research has been going into studying not just the human microbiome, but microbiomes of animals, microbiomes of soils, Soil health is tied up with this. So it's an, a massively important growing, emerging, um, distinctive field. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually start looking at this in the past? Because that would be very, very cool indeed. If you look at the mouth, there is a difference. We know, well, we don't, that other people have done the work, that there's a difference between the composition, the microbiology of the of our nearest uh, relative, um, living relative, chimpanzee, and uh, Brad Pitt. I'm sure he's got a different microbiome to everybody else, a much, much more highbrow one, I'm sure, because he's better food. 
and we, we know there are differences, but do we, can we see that in the past? And look at all those big changes in diet and, and uh, these massive transitions, particularly with agriculture. What happens? Would, there, would we see something uh, and could we then interpret it and use it? Looking at microbiology, you know, from the archaeological record, you know, was people laughed at that 30 years ago or 20 years ago when we were thinking, wouldn't it be good to do that? With the new revolution in ancient DNA, all of a sudden, everything has changed, not just in, in the field of microbiome studies, but in a whole range of other things too. And we did this. And so 30 years later, with some great help from colleagues at Adelaide University, so it did actually start, this first paper ever was published um, with Austra my Australian colleagues. And one of the postdocs is now working at the Charles Perkins Center here, which is brilliant. So we can still carry on doing this, hopefully. Uh, now I've arrived and got really ex excited, but we can see that there are big differences between um, uh, primates, related primates, Neanderthals. We were lucky enough to be, get permission to, to, to take samples from Neanderthals and from modern humans. Look at the difference. The red is, is the dangerous bit, right? These are the pathogenic organisms. And what's fantastic, when we started to look, build these trees, they were really distinctive microbiological signatures for the oral um, um, ecosystems between hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists and we are an outlier because of uh, you know we're at one extreme which is worrying and then uh, people who we weren't quite sure what they were doing so there's a it's so sensitive it looks like there's a phenomenal signature in this um, data set and I, I encourage you not to worry about the, the detail here, but just look at the colors. I goes from early, this is Neanderthals at this end, to these are the test extraction blanks. So from here, this is all the way through from Neanderthals to um, agriculturalists to um, people, uh, agriculturalists and hunter-gatherers in Africa, up into all modern day people here. But just look at Primates and early hunter-gatherers look pretty similar, although there are core differences, but generally look pretty similar. There's some, some very strange something going on in, in African material, which we're not too sure about. These are the early agriculturists, completely different. So you can see that impact on uh, the oral microbiome through that massive transition in diet. Here's medieval period, so we've got mostly farmers and mostly people still doing kind of Neolithic kind of things. Then we have post-industrial revolution, bam, we're into high levels of streptococcus and all the pathogenic things. And the reason we go to the dentist now, not just for cavities, but for a whole bunch of other things related to our wider health. And the dentists or the, the people who were working on this back in the 1990s, who we discussed the idea with said, It'll all gonna, it's all gonna be the same. And they were only studying people from um, Europe and the USA. Who were eating these you know very high carbohydrate diets so they were basically focusing only on this bit here no wonder it all looked the same but once you start looking through time and space in the archaeological record bam you've got a totally different a totally different unique picture so we have real big changes um we can show that neanderthals and hunter-gatherers for the archaeological information we wanted uh, look shared a common microbiome to some of the primates it suddenly changes with the farming you know, beyond recognition, and our modern microbiome is totally pathogenic. We should worry about that. Uh, and the recent drastic shifts in all this microbial diversity have real implications for broadening out that uh, study of, uh, of, of, of how healthy we are. So what if it's a new source of, of, of information we never ever thought we would get at? And beyond, there's some really great papers that obviously we published, but there's a most recent one, which is fascinating about the African story. You can read about it. But the oral microbiome is quite a small part of the, the bigger thing. And the real important work that's going on and the real uh, where the diversity really is, is in the gut. And how can we get at that in the archaeological record? Well, we can get that through massive, great coprolites. Here's the famous Lloyd's Bank stool. A Viking man really had a good sit down and read, read, read a comic for a very long time in a latrine pit. We've got sediments full of fecal material. Remember the Alaskan site, site was covered in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, excrement of both humans and animals. And we've got these fantastically well-preserved, not skeletons, because we're not going to get the stomach contents of really easily uh, of, uh, of those, but we've got desiccated, frozen, this is Lindau Man, which I worked on a long time ago, 
stomach contents full of organic remains. Uh, people are getting really excited about the possibility of going back and exploring the, the gut microbiome. And beyond that, in calculus, in the microbiome, oral microbiome, we can start looking at um, um, antimicrobial resistance because we've got specimens that um, have run those experiment people who are, have now died, who have run those experiments and been subjected to those um, different diseases, um, infectious diseases, before the antibiotic revolution. So pre-1950s and post-1950s material, fantastic data set to actually compare and contrast. We can start looking at pollution and the impact of pollution. Yeah, the, the list is endless. So I'm going to stop very soon, I promise. We are in a new era of understanding the past through all these great techniques. But what's even more exciting is that there are um, real implications for how we can broaden that into real world issues and start using and, and telling people about the archaeological and anthropological record and how crucial it is in our understanding of not only who we are and what we, what we are now, but how maybe even to mitigate some of these things, at least produce models. And I have a shout out for the museum because museums are under threat. All that material and all that amazing stuff with all these real world issues, not just about pots and you know, lovely things about the past, it's about massively important collections to be able to do this kind of stuff. And that's why collections in, in museums like the Chan Chet Wing and, and across the world are incredibly important. And uh, there's a new way we could actually start to engage not only with the collections, but also to, to shout about how important they are and make other people who are interested in what we do much more excited. So archaeological science, can it save the world? Well, I think it can help. And I hope you uh, think that too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. You promised to take us on a journey, and uh, not only have we gone from Narrabri to Alaska, but uh, um, conceptually... Um, Bowels and teeth. A, yeah, yeah, it was a lot, didn't it? I was going to say, I mean, um, uh, the phrase uh, uh, paddock to plate, we all know, but I'm now going to think of it as paddock to book plate too, so thank you for that. I think you should go mouth to bowel. Mouth to bowel. <laughs> it's even better, right? Yeah. Um, we have time for one or two very short questions. If you have a longer question, I'm going to invite you to join Keith and myself down at Sounds Cafe for a drink or a, a meal. Um, and um, I'm sure people will be more than happy to have a chat with you as well. But if anybody online or anyone in the audience has a, a brief question, um, I would welcome uh, you to ask. Um, uh, I, for the benefit of anyone at home, uh, either Keith or myself will repeat the question. But uh, anyone in the room have anything. Yes. Have I changed what? Yeah. Since I've been in Australia, I've never eaten so much exotic fruit in my life. And I think it's doing me a lot of good. But yeah, I have. I have changed my diet. Lots of my colleagues who work, do, who, a very good colleague of mine or a couple of colleagues of mine who work on isotopes have, yeah, have changed their diet quite a lot on the basis of what they found. Yeah. I think there might be some questions online, but I've lost my cursor, so what am I doing? I've got a question. Yep. How much have you looked at the Aboriginal uh, background since you've been on track? I've not looked at any of it at all. You mean background as in the archaeological record? Yes, it applies to what you're telling us about. Well, I'd be very fascinated to do that, but obviously uh, there's... Um, uh, there are other people working on the kind of broader picture. And obviously the Narrowbride project is the first kind of, for me, the first um, sojourn into the kind of exploring the kind of uh, joining those two things together. I think working on, um, as you know, working on with, with, with real people and with um, it's very, very difficult and very sensitive. And so it should be working on, on the remains of, of, of humans themselves. So here, I think that would be, it's not impossible and I, I know people have been working for a long time with communities where that can happen um, but I'm not in any hurry to do that I'm, I think the Narrabar project is going to keep me busy for a while yeah yes where does this lead to this evolution and uh, if you have a part now that we are at this, this point in time now so what can we tell about our future based on this very, very, well, I mean, in terms of diet, in terms of urbanism, in terms of 
disease? What? In terms of diet and evolution. Well, we're on a we're on a very interesting trajectory, and there are people that are you know been arguing that you know we we've, we've stopped evolving, and you know that can't be possible. But I mean, you know, if I knew that, if I knew the answers to that, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be you know a millionaire over in uh, in. Um, the states or somewhere I, I i don't know but obviously looking at the dietary um issues that we have today and the health issues that are linked primarily with diet and lifestyle um i think yeah we've got to do something pretty serious i also think you know in terms of climate change of course we have to um i'm not sure archaeology can help mitigate that it can help us understand what we how fast these things change and where they might happen and what the outcomes might be but i think we may well be beyond stopping or even slowing it down i think we are now into thinking about adaptation and adapting to it so that was what was interesting about um the work in alaska because you know there's a rapid climate change going on now in a different direction changing the availability resources and so we can't just say, well, sorry, that's happened and you know, we, we can't do anything about it. I think people need, want to know what, how that might impact their lives, where they might need to move to because the sea level, the sea is actually encroaching into their communities, but also where their resources are going to be that they rely upon. Um, I've no idea where we're going, but it's, uh, it's an exciting place. I think we just have to be mindful that it's not all going to stay the same. Because clearly the archaeological record tells us that absolutely isn't the case. I love this subject. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone who's joined us today, both online and in the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Those